Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network, the EBM Tools Network for short. And uh, we're very glad you could be here today. This webinar today is co-sponsored by the EBM Tools Network and openchannels.org. Um, and we're very, very pleased today to have Don Wright from Esri and Jenny Lentz from the Aquarium of the Pacific on to, today to talk about story maps. And so it's called, the, today's webinar is an ocean of story maps. And before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that there'll be time for question and answer at the end of the webinar. Um, there's two ways to ask questions. You can raise your virtual hand and I'll unmute you. And you can ask the question directly to John, Dawn and Jenny. Or you can type the question in in the question panel of your user interface and then I'll relay the question to them. Um, the raising your hand part only works if you have a working microphone or if you've entered the PIN number if you're using the phone. Uh, so just be aware of that. And if you want to send in questions throughout the webinar, feel free to do so. Uh, just uh, type them into the question panel. And uh, sort of clarifying questions, um, I may ask the presenters to um, answer during the actual presentation, but all the others I'll hold till the end to the question and answer. But feel free to send in questions anytime. Okay. Well, again, thank you for being here. And, and, and Dawn and Jenny, we're very glad you could be here today. And I'll turn it over to you now, Dawn. Okay. Thanks a lot, Sarah. And I'm really pleased to be uh, tag teaming this webinar with uh, my good friend and colleague, Jenny Lentz. So I'm going to go through a few minutes of uh, presentation, and then I'm going to turn things over uh, to Jenny so that she can introduce herself and uh, give you the second part of, of the story. And we really are keying in on stories today. We're going to uh, tell you all about the, the story map as a medium for, for sharing data, uh, we're all about sharing data and sharing our tools and our approaches in the ecosystem-based management uh, tools network. And oftentimes, we incorporate uh, other media, uh, photos, videos, sounds, maps. So we're going to talk about how uh, there are some easy and hopefully effective ways to bring all of those uh, items together so that we can tell uh, compelling stories about our work and uh, hopefully toward uh, further conservation, uh, use, understanding uh, of the oceans, affecting ocean policy, uh, total world domination, uh, whatever, whatever you'd like in terms of uh, it's, all, it's all for the good. So in terms of stories, how many of us have been captivated by the very simple opening phrase, once upon a time? Uh, we, I think we, we can all attest to the fact that a story is a very powerful means of communicating a message. And the science uh, seems to back that up now, especially in the field of psychology, where over the last several decades, uh, that particular field has begun to seriously study how the story and the medium of the story affects the human mind. And the results are repeatedly showing that our attitudes, our hopes, our values, uh, our fears are strongly influenced by story. And we know even in science and resource management, we're often encouraged not to publish our work or to release our work until it constitutes a complete quote unquote story. So why not combine both science and story or both resource management and story, especially to take advantage of the power of maps and geography to educate, to inform, to inspire people to action, uh, and, and many other uh, great outcomes. So this is what story maps are all about. They're about using maps, especially web maps, in a new and creative and innovative way to get people excited about and involved in our world. And we, better than many other uh, groups are very cognizant of the power of the internet. Uh, many of us are involved in cloud computing. Uh, we're all working not only up at the desktop, but with servers, mobile and tablet platforms. Uh, we, we are the ones who are developing uh, the software, so we know about the ever-involving improvements there. 
but the great thing is that we can continue to put the, the power of these tools, especially the power of GIS, into the hands of our colleagues who are not specialists in these technologies. We can put the power into the hands of journalists, uh, CEOs, school children, even policymakers. So speaking of policymakers, let me just try to illustrate again uh, the power of an effective message, especially through a story. Now as, as scientists, and for many of us as managers, this is the way we communicate, where we want to give a lot of background right up front. We want to talk about prior studies, you know, what our work is building on, and then we go into supporting details, uh, often a lot of information, a lot of description of methodology, uh, of the error and uncertainty in our work, hopefully. And then finally, we key in to a result, and then the implications of that result. Now this is the way that we communicate often through scientific journal articles, through our scientific talks, through our uh, technical reports and so forth. But if we're trying to reach another audience, particularly in this case a policy-making audience, which a lot of us are involved in, uh, especially as we seek to push conservation and resource management uh, objectives and visions, the way that they communicate and the way that they expect to be communicated to is often the opposite. So it's an inverted triangle. They want to get right to the nugget. They want to know what the result is right up front. What is the public good that would come from that result? Then they may want to delve in further into the so what factor, uh, those supporting details. The background, all of the supporting information, all of the, all of the detail that we really love to start off with as communicators, they often don't want to see that or may not be able to absorb that or may not be able to get to that until much farther into the process and hence we may lose them right off the bat if we are dealing with the triangle on the left. So I just wanted to share this as an example of how a story can be a great way to get to that nugget right off the bat and of course to do it uh, compellingly and uh, with some great cartography, some fantastic data and so forth. So let me talk now about communicating specifically with this medium of story maps. I'm going to give you uh, several examples, but I'm going to hold back on the examples because I want uh, to give the bulk of the time actually to Jenny so that she can uh, give you the comprehensive uh, overview of what her organization has actually been doing with story maps. So at this point, I'm going to switch over to the internet and I'm going to go through uh, several live examples, uh, fingers crossed. So this is an example of a very, very simple story map and the idea of this story map is to just uh, give a broad overview of some selected research projects uh, that are going on uh, in the Pacific Ocean. So you can see that you have the interactive map. Uh, there's a panel on the bottom so that you can go to the actual uh, numbers that correspond uh, to uh, the panels uh, here on the right. And one of the things about this kind of presentation is that you can get to a nugget or result fairly simply and easily. This first panel talks about Pacific Ocean science. And if I bring up the text that goes with that panel, this is the nugget in the bottom. No part of the ocean is unaffected by humans now. World governments are thus realizing that exploring and studying the ocean uh, need to become higher priorities. And then we go on to uh, allow the user to explore uh, the different parts uh, of the Pacific Ocean where these uh, studies are, are taking place. Uh, as you can see, very easy to incorporate photos. Uh, in some cases, it's easy to incorporate uh, a video. This story map was done several years ago, so it does not include the much more advanced functions of a story map uh, that is available now. And perhaps many of you on the webinar have actually done a story map or worked with a story map. 
uh, and perhaps many or most of you have not, we hope to provide information for everybody uh, so that you can come away with some very useful uh, ideas. Now with regard to this very simple story map here and the story of Pacific Ocean Science and Exploration, I wanted to share that this basically came from a spreadsheet. So I'm going to pull my spreadsheet up and in this spreadsheet I basically have the numbers of the panels as I like them to appear in the story map, uh, a name for that panel, uh, the caption that appears in the text below that panel, the icons in the map can have different colors so you can indicate red, R for red or P for purple, of course the longitude and latitude for that marker, the URL uh, of the photo or the main image that shows up along with the URL of the small thumbnail beneath. And then I also have here my own notes in terms of uh, the full caption. This was just a spreadsheet that I put together and then I went to my ArcGIS online account and in this case I have an ArcGIS online for organizations uh, account which is a bit more complex but you can do uh, very similar with a, very, with a free ArcGIS online account. And I'd like to emphasize here that we're talking about a technology that is uh, the story map uh, technology is technically uh, open source. You don't need to be an ArcGIS desktop user. Uh, you don't need to be a GIS guru. Uh, we can answer questions about that for you later. But uh, right now, this is very, very, very simple, very simple technology, hopefully very easy. I uploaded my spreadsheet uh, into my account. I made a feature service out of it with just the click of a button. Uh, so that's the Pacific Story Map features that you see here from my CSV file. I'm going to click on the initial web map that I made from that spreadsheet. Uh, here you can put in your metadata, very important to still have metadata involved and then you can actually open up the web map and so here you're looking at only the points, only the latitude and longitude points that were in my spreadsheet. If you do click on any one of those points though, you see what was actually in uh, the spreadsheet. This is a web map that can then be shared and converted into what we call a, a web application. So I can click all of these in terms of how I want this to be shared. I always make my content open to the public, to everyone. And if I wanted to make another web map application, I just click this button. And then it gives you all of the configurable apps that are available within the ArcGIS Online platform. And if you go to, you can see that there are many to choose from. Uh, on page three, there are the story map apps that allow you to build uh, a story map from your, your web map. I chose the basic story map tour uh, configurable app uh, to build my story map and then I was done. So I'm just going to actually cancel out of this. I'm going to go back to my story map because I'm logged into my organizational account and so as such I can switch to builder mode up here in the upper right and the builder mode is just another way that you can actually build your map, your story map. So you may not want to start with a spreadsheet, you may just want to work with the web interface. And so with this particular app and the other kinds of apps have this configuration as well. You can change uh, your settings, of course, share, you can put in your, your media, uh, change your thumbnails, uh, change the marker colors, move them around and so forth. So that's another easy way uh, to build this, this app, to build this story map. All you need is your latitudes and longitudes of the features that you want to focus on. Uh, you need your, your media in terms of your photos or videos and text. And you're pretty much good to go, although we're going to talk about how you should also have a, a good story in mind, your message that you want to tell. 
Let's take a look at a more complex story map that has a very powerful message and uses some more advanced uh, features in the story map app. This was done by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and it's focused on building a more resilient Atlantic coast uh, post Hurricane Sandy. It uses a different style, we call this the side accordion style where the panel with information is on the left rather than on the bottom of the story map. They have included some very helpful links such as this link here which is a video tutorial about how to actually use this story map so you can play this video uh, to uh, understand what this map is about and how to actually use it. I'm going to demonstrate it for you very quickly here. Uh, this map has animations so I can click on the animation button and then see the track of Hurricane Sandy during that fateful period in October of 2012 and I can read about uh, the resilience and recovery uh, projects that were launched uh, after that event. If I go to the resilience projects here it gives me U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service projects, resilience projects by state. If we look at New Jersey uh, we can see that there are 10 projects there for New Jersey. We can zoom to that and automatically with good cartography we are at the right scale and resolution now to see all those 10 projects. We can click on any one of them and here it says click on the image to learn more which gives us even more information about that particular project at that location. Uh, this was a 15 million dollar project for the E.B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge. There's more information that you can read about and so forth. You can go through all of the various projects. The story here is what is being done uh, along the Atlantic coast as supported by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife to recover uh, from Hurricane Sandy and build uh, resilience in those communities. Here are some specific recovery projects. So if we go back to New Jersey, we can see that there are four recovery projects in that state. Clicking on the link uh, gives us information on those uh, projects in that state and in others. We can zoom again into New Jersey to now look at these uh, recovery projects. And again, going back to the Edwin B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge, we can see that this is a different kind of project. This recovery project is uh, over 19 million dollars, close to 20 million dollars in terms of how they've been trying to recover in that area, cleaning up coastal debris, repairing facilities, restoring water uh, infrastructure and so forth. So this is a, a more complex, I think much more engaging uh, story map that has some more advanced features. Again, these are features uh, that you can easily learn about and implement yourself. Let's go to a third kind of story map. This one was extremely popular during Shark Week of last year to raise awareness uh, about uh, sharks and about their conservation and also what is being done in those conservation efforts using GIS. This is what we call a map journal. With a map journal you can incorporate much more text uh, into your presentation. You can also uh, more easily and readily embed uh, videos. So here a general video about the great white shark is there as well as much more compelling larger graphics or photography that covers the entire uh, view for the reader. And this particular story map has a lot of really interesting information talking about the history of man's and, and women's, humankind's relationship uh, to sharks going back to Pacific Island culture. Uh, some shark history, there's a shark icon that is in a terrestrial area. Have no fear, that is correct because it's talking about uh, the fossils of sharks that have been found in sandstone deposits in uh, Colorado and in other, other places. I don't have time to go through this entire story map uh, for you, but I'm going to go down to the end 
where you can see some interesting shark maps, interactive web maps. You can pull down the legend to sheet to see what the different colors mean in terms of the, the shark uh, incidents that have been, uh, that are part of this particular database. If I go to this Mid-Atlantic uh, incident, it talks about something that happened in 2005 in the Atlantic. Uh, the people were rowing. No one was injured, but the shark rammed the boat for 15 minutes. Wow, that must have been uh, quite an incident. And all of these others can be explored. Again, with the map journal format here on the left, there's a lot of room for, for more text, for linking into other, other efforts. So there are other web maps that you can go to, uh, shark protected areas, the IUCN red, thread, uh, red list of threatened species. You can open up that web map made by another organization, the IUCN, and you can explore the, their work as well. The map journal is emerging as a very powerful uh, variation on the story map for sharing analytical results as well. So there are a lot of examples uh, to go to. So this is the ocean of story maps. So the two prior, the three prior maps, story maps that I showed you, the Pacific uh, Ocean Science Exploration story map, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service story map about Hurricane Sandy resilience and recovery, and the Shark GIS, they're all here uh, in this catalog. And this is basically uh, my own catalog of ocean-themed story maps. So this is essentially the ocean of story maps. So you can read uh, the introduction to this blog post. And just use the find function in your browser if you're interested in uh, climate, for instance. Uh, it will take you to these story maps here that talk about ocean acidification. There's a whole group of maps that have been made by Esri Incorporated by our, our staff here at Esri. There's some maps that have been made by our distributors across the world. So there's an Italian uh, story map, Danish, uh, and so forth. Storms in the Netherlands made by the Esri Netherlands distributor. And then the great best part of this list, in my view, is all of these story maps that have been made by you and uh, other, other users of our, our Esri technology. Uh, there's even a group of story maps here made by Clark Magnet School kids. These are high school students who have a fantastic teacher who has been uh, training them up in ocean observing and GIS technology, and they are just creating all kinds of story maps. There are a lot of story maps here on resource management, conservation, science. Uh, again, there are several uh, that actually now are more analytical in their bent. So it's not just showing pictures of places, uh, videos. This is a blog post that talks about the speaking of the language of spatial analysis through story maps and the more analytical maps, uh, story maps that are showing uh, analytical uh, results uh, as part of that. One of them is this uh, storm surge modeling uh, story map that for different categories of hurricanes, in this case in the Gulf of Mexico, up through category five, it gives you the worst case storm surge uh, or inundation scenarios using the National Weather Service uh, slosh model maximum of maximums. Uh, model for hurricanes of uh, different different categories. So uh, everything basically that I am showing you is available at this blog post. This blog post, an ocean of story maps, is going to be continually updated. So I would encourage you to visit it and to bookmark it or grab an RSS feed to it and uh, keep keep apprised with us as this this story grows. Now, in terms of uh, story map resources, uh, in a minute or so, I'm going to turn you over to, to Jenny, who has created some great resources of her own to, to help educate uh, people about story maps. But we would be remiss in at least not showing you the main uh, Esri site, EsriSite storymaps.arcgis.com. 
uh, which tells you all about this particular medium. Uh, it is focused on uh, ESRI technology, but it is possible to tell stories with other technologies. There's even uh, a great company called Map Story that does that, focusing particularly on spatial temporal uh, stories uh, and, and data. But here we're talking about what is available with uh, a free ArcGIS Online for uh, ArcGIS Online account or an ArcGIS Online for organizational account that hopefully your university or your organization has already uh, procured so you can have access to that for free. It gives you uh, these fantastic galleries in terms of what people are creating uh, with this technology. If you browse the story map apps, it tells you about the different styles. So I've shown you an example of a story map tour. I've shown you a story map journal. You'll see more of these from Jenny. Uh, there's a short list, a countdown, a playlist format. You can present one map. You can present a series of maps. You can combine two maps and swipe between them or uh, use a spyglass to cruise around the map and so forth. There are many possibilities here and we are adding uh, to these apps all the time. This link about six steps to publishing your story map is highly recommended because it talks about what to do from start to finish. Step one, what is your story? What is the story that you're trying to tell? What is your message? Then assemble your content, build your map, configure your storytelling app, refine that story, and then publish it. So highly recommend it there. The uh, gallery is also extremely inspiring, and it says get inspired by seeing the many uh, categories of maps, story maps, in architecture and design, uh, conservation and sustainability. Many of these uh, have oceans, ocean themes, uh, events and disasters, infrastructure and planning, uh, particularly with regard to ports, of course, nature and environment. Uh, there is an oceans gallery here and all of the uh, story maps in the oceans gallery are also in my blog post, an ocean of story maps and so forth. And then finally, uh, there is a lot of good information about support. Uh, that includes uh, the open source nature of the story map apps, uh, HTML-based, Python, JavaScript. Uh, you should be able to deploy them uh, on, on, any, on any platform. And you can get uh, support, uh, community support especially, uh, for that. And the blog is also another great way to get support, support and to stay apprised uh, of what we're doing in the story maps world. And I often uh, blog in this space as well, so you can see an ocean of story maps updated as a blog post from later uh, in 2014. So I hope this was a good uh, kind of whet your appetite for learning more about story maps or if you're already familiar with story maps, uh, hopefully you've, you've heard some information that you've not heard from before and certainly Jenny's presentation will uh, really be terrific toward that end. I wanted to point you again and you'll, you'll see these URLs at the end of her presentation also, storymaps.arcgis.com and esriurl.com slash ocean stories is how you can get to the Ocean of Story Maps blog post. And I hope this portion of the webinar has caused you to consider the potential of stories and hopefully you, are, you already have because we're all talking about storytelling these days. Uh, it's, it's running through uh, academia, through the corporate world, we already know about the power of storytelling uh, throughout uh, other aspects of our lives. But in terms of the potential of a good story for integrating, synthesizing your data, messaging, 
your, your analyses really powerful. Consider the implications, hopefully, also for education, for training, for using story maps as part of a curriculum. And again, Jenny will, will touch on this. And even for tool building, uh, we're finding now that developers are using story maps as a way to tell how they built a tool or what, the, what, what is the story uh, of that tool, of that software, of that package. So a story map can accompany those kinds of activities as well. Uh, we're working on a book right now called Ocean Solutions, Earth Solutions. Uh, a lot of it is uh, technology-based, of course. Uh, there are some developers as authors, and they have actually created story maps to go along with the text of their, of their chapters. And Jenny is one of those, those authors. She'll tell you about that also. And of course, we're all concerned about the implications of our work, the implications of ecosystem-based management to contribute to uh, the grand challenges of our society right now, uh, chief of which is the crisis uh, of the oceans, uh, the changing uh, climate affecting our planet, and so forth. So uh, thanks very much. Uh, this is how you can get a hold of me. And again, you'll see some of my information at the end of Jenny's presentation. But now I'd like to turn over my screen and my microphone to, to Jenny so that she can uh, tell you what's going on at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Because I think from the standpoint of contributing to society, our aquaria and museums across the country are doing so much in terms of educating all of us and inspiring inspiring us in our work and uh, about our planet. And so the work at the Aquarium of the Pacific is uh, pretty, pretty terrific. And so I'd like for you to hear about what Jenny and her colleagues are doing. So Jenny, I will turn over to you now. Sounds and good. Thank you very much, Don. Hopefully everybody can hear me all right. So as Don mentioned, I work at the Aquarium of the Pacific. And the aquarium has recently been uh, last year or so, maybe a little bit more than a year, we have started using GIS and specifically story maps as an additional way of engaging the public in ocean science. And we've begun doing this in a number of ways, and we're also trying to evaluate how effective each of these different tools that we are using are. So I'm going to start by showing you some of the ways that we're using these story maps. Um, all of our story maps are available to the public online at aop.maps.arcgis.com. And I'll show this link again at the end of the presentation. But I thought I would begin by walking you through some of the different categories of story maps we've been working on. We have a number of different types of story maps, and each of them has a different goal in mind. For example, we have story maps about our animals. Um, oftentimes, we have exhibits with individual animals inside those exhibits that really connect to the public. For example, our penguins. Everybody loves penguins. They want to know all about our penguins. Um, so I'll start by showing you our penguin story map here. So if you go to our main story map page and click the um, AOP penguin story map, you'll open a screen that looks similar to this. And this story map is designed to give you the story of the penguins we currently have on exhibit. It starts by showing a map of the range of Magellanic penguins, and then if you click this arrow here or any of the penguins below, it'll navigate through the story map. And it first begins by showing a picture of our penguins on exhibit with a description of the exhibit. And then it, it's linked to a map on the right here that shows where the Aquarium of the Pacific is located. And then as you continue to click through, you'll find out about our individual penguins. For example, example uh, Ludwig here, he is our rowdy penguin. And you can see a picture of him, see on the map that we originally got him from the San Francisco Bay Area. And then you can read a little blurb about his personality and what a typical day is like hanging out with Ludwig, which tends to be pretty exciting for our guests. They definitely interact a lot with our penguins. We also have another story map, our Southern California Steelhead story map which is designed to give you more information about the exhibit as well as the animal. And this story map actually won first place at the Oceans Forum in 2014. Now, this story map um, uses the map journal story 
interface, which Don talked about, that's the same template that the shark story map she showed earlier used. And as you go through the interface, you find out a little bit about our exhibit. Then you're given detailed information about um, Southern California steelhead and some of the problems they're facing. It walks you through some of their history. For example, this map shows the historical distribution of Southern California steelhead. And then as you continue to go through, you see that currently they have a much smaller area that you can find them in. And in large part, this is due to changes in the environment that are caused by man, such as we've dammed a lot of the rivers that they traditionally use to get to portions of their habitat. And then this is an especially unique exhibit because our exhibit is sectioned off into three segments. And each segment represents the story of Southern California steelhead in different spatial environments. So we tried to capitalize on this by walking guests through each of the exhibits and showing them the environments they're modeled by using the story map. So for example, on the far uh, left side of our exhibit is our upper elevation habitat, which you can see on the left side of the screen here with the diagram of our exhibits. And then on the right, it shows you a map of the type of habitat we're talking about here. It's upper elevation. It's where a lot of these fish begin their lives. And then as you go down, the middle portion of our exhibit models middle, ele middle elevation habitats. And so you can see the map has moved to show more of mid-elevation habitats. And then the last segment of our exhibit models the portion of their life history stage where they're found in estuarine habitats. And so again, our map has moved out to more of an estuarine environment. So right there, we've showed our guests how our this one exhibit models the entire life history of Southern California steelhead. And then the story map ends with additional information that guests who are interested in Southern California steelhead, um, they can use this page to do additional research projects. We also have um, at least one story map, hopefully soon we'll get more, about some of the experiences our staff have had. So for example, if you're on our main page here and you hit this um, arrow key, you can navigate through to different story maps. And next I'm going to talk about our vision story map right here, which follows Emily Yam, one of our educators, as she joined the crew of the RV Thompson, which is a deep sea research vessel back in 2013. And they were laying cables to try and improve the connectivity of um, science and various other things. Um, but she joined this deep sea research vessel cruise for a couple weeks. And as she was on the boat, she would send me pictures and their location for any given day. So as you flip through the story map, you can actually follow her as she was on. And we had the story map updated live so that guests could tune into it during her cruise and see where she was on any given day and some of the things she was saying. For example, on the fourth day of her cruise, she saw a sea pig um, in some pretty deep water, which was a really neat way for people to follow our educator on some of the unique adventures that we have here at the aquarium. We also work a lot with other facilities similar to ours here at the aquarium. And we have a story map that really kind of summarizes the different facilities we work with, which is our CELC story map, which stands for Coastal Ecosystem Learning Centers. So this story map connects all of the United States, um, and I believe there's also one in Mexico, Coastal Ecosystem Learning Centers, which are facilities, usually aquariums, that are designed to preserve, protect, um, and restore our coasts and help to educate the public about our coasts. So as you look at the story map, you see different regions. And then as you click through, you the map travels to each of those locations. You can see a picture of the location, their address, and then there's also a link to the actual facility. So that will connect you to the facility's website. And that's just a great, great way of helping our guests um, learn more about similar facilities to the aquarium. We also have just recently started to make story maps that are more content driven and focused on issues, such as our um, seafood story map. So this story map has a great deal more text in it 
and it will walk through and teach um, the audience a little bit more about Southern California seafood and global seafood, how seafood can be used sustainably. Um, it talks about exclusive economic zones where seafood is being fished. And as you go through, you can learn where the 10 largest exclusive economic zones are. And then it will go on to show you um, the United States zones. And it really goes into this topic in much more depth, which uh, may not be ideal for connecting to the public out on the floor of the aquarium. But it's definitely an important resource that our guests can go to at home to learn more about these important issues that we talk about here at the aquarium. We also have just recently started working on another story map. So I'm going to click through this website here. Um, it's on the third page of our story maps. We're working on a story map, which is an ocean exploration story map. And this one I'm actually going to go to live. So bear with me here as I switch screens. Let's see. Hopefully I can switch to the internet and show you this story map live. So we're going to switch over here. Um, this is a working draft of our exploration story map. It's by no means done just yet. Um, a lot of the content you see in here may not be in the final version. We're using it as placeholders. But the unique part about this story map is that it actually has story maps inside of story maps. So for example, when you open the story map, we have, this is using the map journal layout, which we've seen in previous story maps. But on the right here, we've embedded a map tour story map. So this story map on the right shows a little bit about where we're following different deep sea research vessels. So there's currently a program which is based out of the Inner Space Center in um, Rhode Island, and it shows a picture of the Inner Space Center here on the right, which connects different deep sea research vessels as they travel the world and actually connects the public to the live science that's happening there. And then as you click through the story map, it'll take you to the current location of some of the research vessels. So for example, the EV Nautilus is currently um, in, uh, it's in Florida right now, waiting for its next mission. And you can go through and see where each of the ships are and read um, a little blurb about what they're doing, where they currently are. Most of our ships are currently in port for the winter season. They haven't quite gone out to sea yet. But then if you click back over here on the left and navigate down, you can go through and you can learn a little bit about the work that's being done at the Inner Space Center. Um, you can see I've got some videos embedded in here that summarize a lot of this material. You can learn about how the Inner Space Center is using telepresence to connect the live science that's being done out in the deep sea to people around the world. Um, so this graphic on the right here shows how data is being transmitted from an ROV in the deep water all the way up to the ship and then beamed out to a satellite which then makes it to the Inner Space Center and around to anyone that connects to the Inner Space Center through the internet. Uh, you can continue to go down, learn more about ROVs and research vessels. So you can see already that this story map has much more detailed information than some of the previous ones. Um, you can go through and then learn about each of the ships that we're following. For example, you can click on the EV Nautilus's page. And on the right here, we've actually embedded the website for Nautilus Live. So guests can see live information that they're posting there without us having to constantly maintain that. It's just we've embedded their website within this. Now, as I mentioned, this is um, still a working draft. This isn't by any means the final draft. A lot of the graphics you see in here are placeholders. But it's a nice one-stop shop for guests when we're trying to teach them um, about ocean exploration and really get them excited about um, what's happening right now with, ocean, with the field of ocean exploration. And now I'm going to attempt to go back to the PowerPoint here. Let's see if we can pick that back up. So I've given you a little glimpse of some of the types of story maps that the aquarium is making. Now, we want to be careful that we're not just pumping out a lot of story maps. We want to make sure that these story maps 
are reaching their intended audience. So one thing we've recently started doing is um, for story maps that we think would work well out on the floor of the aquarium, we've started to train our interpreter staff to bring iPads out on the floor and help connect our guests to these story maps and help to further their understanding of the exhibits they're at. For example, these pictures here show um, one of our staff members introducing a guest to our Southern California steelhead story map, and she's standing at her steelhead exhibit. So this is a great way of letting our audience know that we have this additional content available online. They can pull it up on their phone, their tablet, go home and pull it up on their home computer, and use that as an additional resource to learn about our exhibits and the animals that we have on exhibit. And a lot of the different um, conservation messages and ocean, and just basically about ocean science. Um, now, as part of this, we want to make sure that what we're doing is effective. So we also have a survey that our staff fill out so we can figure out and gauge as the program goes on just how effective these story maps are. By looking at the results of the story map we, or the survey, we can see um, were guests engaged in the story map? Did they ask for the website afterwards? Did they ask additional questions or have suggestions for additional story maps they'd like to see made? Um, was it easy to use an iPad out on the floor? Were you comfortable using the iPad? We can get a real feeling for how our staff worked with the story maps as well as the guest response to it. And we can use this data to move forward in the most effective and meaningful way possible. Um, as Don mentioned, we also work a lot with teachers here at the aquarium. So every year we have several teacher workshops that we host. Um, and recently we've begun including as part of this um, guest lectures about how teachers can incorporate GIS and story maps into their classroom. So for example, um, both this past August and August of 2013, I gave a story map lecture to our Boeing Teacher Institute workshop where I really introduced them to the idea of GIS and walked them through how they can use story maps in the classroom. We also had a NASA teacher workshop which was more data oriented, so I created a different um, presentation and story map specifically for this workshop, which really honed in on where teachers can access live environmental data, how they can bring this into a map, and use it in their classrooms. And with all of these guest lectures, we have tutorials that go with them. These tutorials are available to the public, um, and they really provide step-by-step -step information for non-GIS people to help them recreate the exact story maps that we just talked about during the guest lecture. Now, for anyone interested, I can show you how to get to those tutorials. You would just go to our main um, story map homepage, which the link for that will be at the end, but it's aop.maps.arcgis.com. And then you would click on Gallery up at the top. You'll see a page that looks similar to this. You'd then click on Files right down here. When you click on files, you'll get a sum, it's a slimmed down version of all the material we have available. Now, all of our tutorials are technically on this top row right here, but if you just want to make sure that that's what you're looking at, you can go ahead and click on PDFs, and it'll just show the links to PDF files. And that'll take you through and link you to step-by-step -step tutorials for um, some different ways that you can use story maps and GIS in classrooms or just in general to the public. Um, in addition to these tutorials, we, as Don mentioned, we also contributed a chapter to the upcoming book, Ocean Solutions, Earth Solutions, which talks about how the aquarium is using GIS to really engage the public in ocean science through the use of global stories. And we're doing that in the story maps that you saw here. We've got some other exhibits around the aquarium that also use, a G, that use GIS in a variety of ways. And it talks about, our chapter at least, talks about how informal um, science education is really an important way of reaching out to the public and engaging them in ocean science. And that GIS, specifically GIS linked to stories, is a really powerful tool that we can use to do this and effectively communicate our message. 
and I will open it up to questions and leave this on our uh, contact info page so that everybody can see how to get in touch with both Don and myself. Oh, this was fabulous. Oh, Don and Jenny, this was great. Um, <clears throat> it was great to, to see how story maps are used, and this was a great overview and provided fabulous resources. So uh, just to start off, thank you guys so much. Uh, if people want to send in questions, uh, go ahead. We don't have a ton of time for questions, and we, we have a couple already. Um, but the question, I'll be able to send the, any questions you send in uh, to Don and Jenny. Uh, so they may be able to respond to them uh, regardless, even if we don't have time on today's webinar. So uh, let's see, to get started. Um, a question that came in early on is a good one. Uh, where's the best place to store your pictures and videos for a story map? Um, I store mine on uh, Picasa, a Google free account. I created my own Google Aquarium account, and I store them there. It's a free site. And um, with story maps, you have to have your pictures stored on a website. So it has to, you link to a URL. You don't upload files. So Picasso has been an easy way for me to link to different pictures. Um, I know uh, Flickr is also a pretty common place that people store pictures. Yeah, and there's, um, I, I think a lot of people are using uh, Picasso and Flickr now. It used to be that people who uh, started off with story maps would just, uh, they would have access to a web server at their university or their organization. But there's really no need for that now with um, uh, with these public utilities uh, that allow you to store all kinds of different things. And uh, if uh, people are interested, there are a couple of really good uh, story map blog posts that uh, give you more information about that, particularly with regard to working uh, with Flickr. So I'd be happy to, to pass that on uh, offline. OK, thank you very much. Um, and a question that I was also in, interested in, um, Jenny, have you looked at website analytics to also measure audience participation? And I was just wondering if you could also address, like, both of you, if, if necessary, um, is there, are there easy ways built in to track usage? Um, I have looked at web analytics to see how much of this, um, how much of our story maps were being accessed through my personal website. Um, as far as through the ArcGIS Online account, I can see how often our story maps are clicked on, but I haven't spent much time going into the actual analytics to see the order that people access the web maps, um, how frequently they go to them, whether or not they're coming back. So it's definitely on our list of things that we wanted to explore further, but unfortunately, we haven't quite gotten there yet. But that's something that we're very interested in. Yeah, it's a great question because if you go to the home page for your story map in ArcGIS Online, uh, ArcGIS Online will create a home page for you automatically. It will give you uh, ratings just in terms of one to five stars and how many views. So that's one type of analytics, but it's, uh, it's not as detailed as what uh, Jenny and, and others are hoping for. And the uh, Esri Story Maps team is looking into, into that issue. Uh, we actually have some pretty detailed uh, analytics here at Esri so that we can uh, track the, uh, the usage of, uh, of our story maps. And we're working on uh, porting uh, that capability so that uh, the uh, Esri users can take advantage of that as well. OK, great. Thank you, guys. Um, there's a question. So GIS Online works with credits. Um, how big is the average story map? Well, that's a good question. It really varies by the story map and what type of data um, you've put into it. I've had story maps which didn't use any credits. And then I've had story maps where I uh, did a lot of georeferencing of addresses, and they used a lot of story map a lot of credits just in the creation um, as it figured out where different addresses were located. Um, there are different files that you can load into a story map um, that will use different amounts of credits. It's, it's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, I'm the only person at the aquarium that makes story maps, so 
it's pretty easy for me to monitor it. But at an organization where lots of users are making story maps, it's something that the administrator is going to want to constantly be monitoring. Because it's sometimes hard to judge just how many credits um, certain services are going to pull up. Most of mine um, either use no credits or a handful of credits, which usually are given, um, I believe it's a couple thousand per year um, as part of your ArcGIS online account. So I haven't personally had a problem running through credits, but it's something that with lots of users using the same account, it's something you have to monitor. Okay, okay, that's useful. Um, great. And there's a question, are the story maps discoverable or do people need to have the direct link to get there? Well, they're, they're, to they're totally discoverable. Uh, the, for some story maps, uh, they will be featured on the storymaps.arcgis.com site. Uh, but if you, the, the most important thing you can do with your story map is to uh, put in tags, put in as many tags as, as possible. Make sure you put in a tag uh, story map and uh, or put in a tag ocean. Uh, those are the two obvious ones. And you, that will help the story maps to be uh, completely discoverable within the broader ArcGIS Online system that platform. You can Google them as well. I just Googled Aquarium Story Maps and we were the top hit. Um, so it depends on the search terms, but you can find some of them just through Google as well. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, then this is a good question. Uh, is there a way to use Story Maps as a portal to input participatory geographic information? Uh, they're just starting to work on that. Um, I believe there's an app that's currently in the works that's going to be a sort of citizen science app that loads directly to a story map. Um, but there is a free app currently available that people can download. And as you take pictures, geo-reference pictures on your phone, it directly makes the story map. So you could launch a story map from your cell phone or mobile device without even using a computer. But as far as multiple users, I believe there's Esri is still working on getting that functionality available. And uh, the, the, there is a function called uh, an editable feature service. So, so that is available right now. It's, uh, it's very rudimentary, but it is a way to capture participation uh, within a story map. Uh, for instance, at the most recent GIS Day, the International GIS Day in November 2014, uh, there was a school group in the UK that sought to uh, set a world record for uh, an online interactive map in real time. And they had uh, schools and children all over the world uh, using editable feature services to put very uh, simple information about their school uh, on this it, within this story map uh, on November 14th, I believe. So, uh, so that kind of participation is readily available now. But uh, there's a lot more, and, and Jenny is right, we're, we are working on that. OK, thank you, guys. Let's do one more question. Um, and that is, are there best audiences for this tool? Uh, who is the top target for this type of learning? Um, I think from the aquarium standpoint, it depends on the story map. We have different audiences for different story maps. Some are um, targeted more to our guests when they're at the aquarium. Some are targeted more towards uh, researchers and politicians, it, it totally depends on the story map. Um, from giving talks to different school teachers, I, show, I ask first what types of classes the teachers teach. And if I have a room full of history teachers, I'll show them history story maps that they can use in their classroom. And they can either create their own, or they can help to teach their students history by using story maps. So there's definitely different audiences for different story maps. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And uh, in terms of my own work at Esri uh, with uh, chief science uh, initiatives, uh, we are using story maps on a range from anyone who doesn't have any experience with GIS or geospatial. The story map immediately grabs them. Uh, oh, I have to apologize. I'm in my home office, and I've got this. I got this clock for Christmas. So at the top of the hour. It, 
sings his snooky <laughs> tune. Uh, <laughs> and it's it, a good it's reminder. Wow. <laughs> so I guess I have background music here. But we're also using them very effectively for policymakers because they, it really resonates with them. Okay, that's fabulous, Don. And are there any, um, well, I said we didn't, but are there any really good examples of um, sort of influences the story maps have had that you can relate now? Uh, there's one I'll, I'll just quickly share. In December, uh, Esri released with, along with the USGS, uh, an ecological land units uh, map. It's the uh, currently the world's most detailed uh, ecological uh, map at a 250 meter uh, scale. Uh, I'm sorry, 250 meter resolution for the entire world. It was commissioned by the Group on Earth Observations, and it's also part of uh, the President's Climate Data Initiative. And we created a story map uh, to talk about that project and to introduce the map. Uh, two policymakers in Washington, D.C. Uh, it was also uh, announced by Sally Jewell, Secretary of the Interior, and it seems to be making quite a big impact because we've had a lot of media attention uh, on, on that project. And it started with our ecological land units uh, story map. So uh, you can go to esriurl.com slash ELU uh, to see that example. So that's a recent one. And the next project is an ecological marine units map uh, that will be going through, we'll be doing this, the same thing for the oceans, much more difficult, but there will be uh, probably a series of story maps coming out of that effort to communicate that project as well. Oh, fantastic. Well, we hope to feature that when it's ready. Um, I know I said those were going to be the last questions, but two really quick ones. Um, what is the name of the free app that would turn the geotagged photos into a story map? Um, Snap2Map. Um, I actually have a step-by-step -step tutorial up on our website about that. Um, so it's one of the four PDFs that I showed. Um, let's see if I can click to it right now. Um, yeah, that would be that would be great because someone actually asked for that URL. Let's see here. Um, from this page right here, the Snap2 map would be this third story map here that says Creating Map Tour Story Maps. Um, that tutorial will walk you through the app and how to access it. And what is the URL you're at right now? Um, this Can we see is it anywhere? Capture from the aop.maps.arcgis.com. Okay, and I think Nick posted that. Is that right, Nick? Or could you go ahead and post that? Yeah, I have the Aquarium of the Pacific link up there, but not the Story Maps one. Okay. This is this is from that same website. It's all connected to our homepage. Oh, gotcha. Um, okay. So for, I've got it open online right now. Um, so it's this third one right here. Um, you get to it by going to the aop.maps.arcgis.com. And then when you open it, it'll go through step-by-step -step instructions on how to um, start making story maps, basically, how to open an ArcGIS online account. And then this is the Snap to Map um, application that you would download. And it shows you how to use that app to actually make a story map. Oh, that, fantastic. That's a great resource. Um, and then uh, the final question, someone just wanted to confirm that it is possible to do this free of charge to create a, a story map. How do, you, how do you get started with that? Um, I'm trying to think. It's definitely free of charge for educators. Um, ArcGIS Online has a free account that you can do, but I'm not sure how much you can do with Story Maps with the free account. Don, maybe you can speak more to that. Yeah, you can do quite a bit with um, uh, with the simpler Story Maps on a, with a free ArcGIS uh, account. So if you go to StoryMaps.ArcGIS.com, uh, it tells you how to do that. But basically, you set up a free uh, ArcGIS Online account. Uh, you'll be given uh, number of credits free, and those credits allow you to upload data and to make uh, any number of story maps. If you're going to do a really, really complex one, uh, you'll probably get a message uh, about uh, subscribing for more credits. 
but the free account really helps you to get started uh, quite readily uh, with a lot of content and a lot of story maps. Okay, wonderful. Um, guys, thank you so much. The, the, this is great. Um, the, uh, several questions about the availability of a recording. Yes, we are, have recorded this webinar and it will be available uh, within a few hours probably on openchannels.org. And also you could uh, contact me, Sarah underscore Carr at natureserve.org and I can uh, email you the link uh, when it, once it's posted. Um, so Don and Jenny, thank you so, so much. We really appreciate you doing this and, uh, and, and Don, I just wanted to say, uh, uh, let everyone know, Don has actually been a member of the network since it was a teeny tiny thing of 20 or so odd people and, uh, and since 2006, so we're, we're going on uh, nine years now and, and we very much appreciate your participation in this whole time. Um, and finally, just thank everyone who was able to attend. We had fantastic uh, attendance today and hopefully there will be a, a tsunami of additional story maps being created as a result of the knowledge that people have gained from this webinar and the fantastic resources you've been shown by Jenny and Dawn. So thank you everyone. Have a great afternoon and uh, we hope to see you on future webinars. Thanks so much. It was fun. Yes, thank you for including me. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye, guys, and uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Good.